Hi guys, and thanks for tuning in. This week, we're giving away a copy of the Mighty Reich Busters. We're gonna show you inside this in a, in a couple of minutes. To be in with a chance of winning this, all you have to do is hit like on this video, make sure you're subscribed, and post a comment below. And if you could help us get past this YouTube algorithm by sharing this video, just dropping a link to one or two of your friends that would be amazing, be a massive help. Right, we have a lot to get through because the weekend starts now. Welcome to the Weekender, folks. Right, before we get stuck in it, will we prize this box open just to show them some of the stuff that's in it? Yeah, I've, I've kind of been making people jealous with this box because I've done an unboxing for it. It hasn't went out yet, but I've been playing it at the club. Yeah. So this is your unboxing. You're opening it up to show the box, but this is after I've played with it and repacked everything down. Yeah, so this is this is our copy. Yeah, this okay. is our studio copy. So look, we just want to show you what's in it. Right, right, yeah. right. Prize the box open, Jerry. She has a tight box. Oh, I love it. Love it. Feel the girth. Love it. Ooh, right. So in that box, you're going to get a mission book. Yeah. Book of with, missions. Um, and you, Justin, you've been playing the missions. Have you been enjoying it? I have, and I love the names for some of the missions. There's one yeah. of them. It's called I Did Not See That Coming. I Did Not See That Coming. That, I see that what is, it did. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so you get your, your missions, your rules. Yeah, you get your dice, five yeah. of each type. Dice. Let's go to the minis! That's the big villain box. Okay, let's see what's in that. Well, it's the box, the big box of the small villains. The big box. <laughs> yeah. So in there, so you're getting all of the experimental uh, miniatures that were being experimented on by the Nazis. Yeah. You've got your soldiers, you've got your officers, you've got your heavy troopers in there, you've got your scientists. And your dogs. And your bomb walkers. And your dogs, right? Okay. Right. And then we have this. The small box with the heroes and the big enemy. You get oh, hands and there. Not only that, but you get your control consoles as well. Yeah, I love the way they've designed these control consoles because they've actually put a little bevel into them. Yeah. So that you can actually, instead of having to dig your fingernail in to get your tokens out, you can press it down and it just pops up for you. Oh, so you get all so that. Cool. Isn't that? So you've got those little bevels there. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got your six heroes in there, and as well as that, you've got your two Vrillmeisters in there. Uh huh. Uh, another scientist, another officer, I think. Uh -huh. uh, a couple of zombies. And what's the big dude called? Uh, that is the the Panzer Mech. The Panzer Mech. A Vril Panzer, sorry, it's called Vril Panzer. Vril Panzer, right? Yeah, John actually did a paint tutorial for one of those. Happy days. Mm. Other than that, you get a box full of all of the components, the cards, yeah. the tiles. No, it doesn't come with all the Ziploc bags. Yeah. Those are just normal little food bags that I've packed everything down are into. Are the tiles double sided? Tiles are double sided. <laughs> Right, okay. And then you get a deck of cards which gives you basically a miniaturized version of your mission map. Uh -huh. So whenever you're figuring out what tiles you need, you can just refer to the card instead of constantly being mucking around with a book. There you go. There and you go. that's just the core set. That's, yeah, there you go, guys. So um, one of you lucky dudes um, who likes, subscribes, comments, and shares, please. Um, yeah, you'll, you'll be in, uh, in with a chance. So. I suppose at this point, I would like to thank everybody that has got involved in last week's competition. Mm -hmm. um, the winner is up on our prize centre, so if you go across to the prize centre, you can claim your prize. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to do a massive thank you to everybody who signed up to the Cult of Games last week. Um, I, I managed to, to re get a conversation with a few of you on email, and it, you're getting into our Discord servers and stuff like that. Look, in... Um, we can't continue to do this without the support of uh, of the Cult of Games members. Backstage, basically, you'll remember that. Um, so if you could, if you could spare the cost of a cup of coffee a month to get a whole lot of, you know, additional kind of perks and content and, you know, to be in there with us, um, keeping this project running, that would be awesome. Double thumbs up. That would be a double thumbs up. Right. We have a bunch of Flames of War content and Team Yankee content mm -hmm. that's coming. We do. But 
it seems that we're using this as an opportunity for, for me to do a QVC on you all. <laughs> so um, it's just to let you know, you may not know that the On Tabletop team, um, uh, that we have a little location, a store, mm -hmm. where you can go to buy some of your fine wares, okay? Mm. Uh, but this is the On Tabletop store. We have been running it now um, for about oh, about seven or eight months, the online aspect of it. It's uh, connected to the visitor center that we opened here to try and help uh, build a wargaming community uh, in our local area. Um, we're very proud of it. We work very hard at it, and we work it. So, you know, we lick all your stuff before you get it. You know, yeah. like, <laughs> and, and sometimes I will put messages in boxes to let people know that I've yes, done that. Yes, you get yeah. messages. You can hit us up with special requests. You would not believe the number of requests that we get to write, this guy's a winner on the box. Yeah. Very happy to do that. Yeah, yeah it's only an extra five point surcharge per box. <laughs> so um, uh, we're on all of this kind of like, um, you know, Games Workshop stuff, we ship all the way out throughout Europe. Mm. Everything else, we ship worldwide. The only and thing we're missing is Justin Blankets. Mm. Yes, we're out of stock of Justin Blankets, um, uh, but we have been talking to a cornflake factory to try and see if they can make a replica. And <laughs> yep. uh, thank you, but no thank you. I do not sign off for any likeness rights whatsoever in perpetuity for this. Well, uh, well I was thinking you just get a cornflake and a peanut. And it, it <laughs> that, that's, that's the Flames of War stuff on the store. Is there new yes. stuff? There is. Yeah, yeah, There's there brand is. new releases uh, for Flames of War and for Team Yankee. Um, it's all there uh, on the store. Um, yeah, and Cult of Games members, you know, every week we try to do an extra special deal um, for Cult of Games members as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you if you join the Cult of Games, you know, if you, if you join today, right, feel free to email us or drop us a message or contact us on the Discord with um, a special offer you'd like to see, mm. uh, because you know, we're always open and receptive. Uh, to our community, and um, you know, building up that wee store and being able to send stuff to you guys has been has been fantastic. It allows us, it's allowed us to, you know, to add an aspect to what we do, to be able to physically get stuff to you as well. And it, yep. it's been it's been really good that way. I'm, I think I'm really I think, pleased I think my it. favorite section of the store is the hobby bit. Yes, because we've got this really cool one. We've got loads of green stuff world. Yep, we've got a lot of Citadel stuff in it. So yeah, awesome. I can just go there right now. Yeah, so in the uh, one of the things, uh, one of the features of the site that we're particularly proud of is down on the side there, you can see there's a whole lot of filtering mechanisms. So you can filter by paint types, by color palette, you can filter by uh, tool types, material types. You can even get down to the diameters. We have the very diameters of our of our magnets and things mm -hmm. like that, and we have the magnet grades uh, and stuff in there. So, you know, what we've tried to do is to try and give especially in the hobby materials. Mm. We've tried to uh, give you a way to be able to browse around, discover stuff um, uh, that you've maybe never seen before. Because this has been one of the, the great things um, for us as well, is being able to, to get to try some of the hobby materials and stuff that's out yeah. there. That, that you maybe just, you never, you never think to try and, or you and, never realize is there. And it gives a chance to bring the Dirty Downs range back. Yes. Because you'll have seen us using that for years and years and years, but yes. it, was, it was known as model mates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But now it's dirty downs. But most of, most people in the modeling, like in the miniatures community, weren't getting it. So we now have that. Yeah, we, we managed to get a, get a hold of the, the folks that were behind model mates. Uh, they still produce the, the sprays and some of the, the, the things, uh, but it's used, it was used not only in the models uh, industry, um, it, it's probably better known to be used in the movie industry, and that's yeah, for that weathering their, down like yeah, sets and stuff. For weathering sets or weathering uh, costumes and, yeah. and stuff like that. But if you've ever watched our preps for boot camps and things like that, oh, it's amazing. they are it's, a lifesaver. It's a god save uh, uh, for weathering. Um, so the dirty down stuff, you know, it, it's now in bigger cans. Yeah. It's exactly the same stuff, like, and it's. Yeah, we like, got it. Like the Star Wars Legion weekend we did, I pretty much transformed a table within minutes. Yeah. Well, you'll remember even for the weekend that we did for Flames of War, yep. where we did the, the, the almost like the two tables of a, kind of like a city. Yeah. And we took all those houses, and every one of those houses 
we, we had finished within a few hours by using spray model mates mm -hmm. to weather the whole lot down to create a, a proper battlefield city rather than this perky little yeah, Teletubby bright, kind, bright of a, thing, yeah. kind of a look. You know, we really were able to bring everything down. Yeah. We have recolored maps with it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like it's been... The, this sort of map here. Yeah, yeah. neoprene mats. I have, a, I have a technique that I use, uh, use it to make trees mm -hmm. or use it to paint trees. And I can paint trees in about uh, a minute and a half. Mm. Um, perfect looking trees every time. Big yeah, gnarly this is the bark, bark trees. Big gnarly yeah. bark trees, yeah. yeah. So um, uh, I must, uh, I will, I will, do you know what? We will do a jerry can on that some yeah. of these days and uh -huh. see how that goes. The castle for Acker. Yes. That, that all got hit with 30 down and yeah. it works so, so well. Yeah. So, yeah, we've, we've been trying to build a store, obviously, by gamers for gamers mm. and uh, one of our really big parts of it um, has been the hobby materials you know the kinds of stuff that you can use to get those special effects and things like that anyway buy merch enough of that <laughs> enough of that enough of that right my favorite part mm. this is this is what we're becoming known for the little guys get to go first little guys to the front ben it's time for Indie of the Week. Who did we pick this week, Ben? Uh, so the company that we picked out this week are a little company that does, I suppose you'd say, big miniatures. Uh, so this is Creature Caster, and they have been doing some absolutely stunning models on a rather huge scale that you could use effectively as what we'd like, I suppose you could say, a centerpiece for your army or maybe just a display piece that you want to show off. So Creature Caster uh, work on a huge range of massive things like demons and oh. monsters and all different things like that. All of them are within sort of like 28 to 32 millimeter scale, but yeah. they then stretch up to as high as 8 to 10 inches in height, which is pretty insane. My um, goodness, we're looking at the suzerain of desire yes, at the moment, yeah. and that is that's just an incredible model. If you were playing um, an, a, a Sylvaneth uh, uh, tree man army, holy smokes! Yeah, I think you could get away with that for the deepkin as well. There's something quite yeah. aquatic about it. Oh, yeah, when you look at the tails, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one of the, uh, the whole sort of range that Creature Caster have done have kind of been influenced a little bit by uh, the likes of One Forty Thousand, Age of Sigmar, and that kind of thing. So that's kind of where you're seeing a lot of that influence come through. But they've also gone and done a lot of slightly more original stuff as well, and they've created some really interesting looking monsters too. But effectively, these are the kind of things that you might want to pick up if you're one running, for example, like a demon army, or you're doing Silver Death or Deepkin and that kind of thing. So yeah, they've they've really gone into the sort of nitty gritty of creating some rather fascinating looking characters that you could use in, the, in those kind of games so these guys have come on leaps and bounds they have yeah. since the, the first time i remember seeing their stuff some years ago and it was mm. good then but it wasn't a touch on what we're looking at here this stuff is incredible yeah, and, and one of the other big things that they've been doing quite recently, well, uh, as recently as last year, I believe, actually, they've started to be able to um, get it out to more people across the world. Um, so normally there was a lot of problems with kind of distribution and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But they've now got to the stage where they can sell it in the UK, in the EU, and America, and all over the place. Um, so there's loads of really good options if you want to dive in and pick up one of these models. Um, as I said, these are effectively like a painter's dream. You know, they're one of the, some of these massive resin kits that you could work on and just spend months and months painting, trying to perfect it to go on the mantelpiece or something. But uh, they also have game uh, interests as well, of course. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, very cool. guys, there you have it. So you can find them at creaturecaster.store. Um, nice and easy. Mm -hmm. Not hard to remember that one. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, cre uh, Creature Cast, some beautiful stuff. Yeah, if I remember right, Jerry, we've unboxed some of their stuff before. I think it was some terrain components. Have we? I remember it. <laughs> yeah, much better memory than me, then. Yeah, it's um, who knows, right? I remember it. It was like a, a big tooth moth thing it. coming up out the ground. Mm -hmm. Justin's like trying to remember something, so he turns to the oldest looking person. Yeah. In the yeah. Studio. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, no, no, hang on. Can hang you on. remember anything? <laughs> Jerry has one oh, of God. the best memories in here, especially for historical facts. <laughs> yes, he remember. But, re but if you're talking about the same mall I think you're talking about, I'm pretty sure that's not Creature Caster. Nearly certain it was. I'm. A, I, do you know what? Poll of the week. <laughs> who do we trust, Jerry or Justin? <laughs> I know who gets my vote, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Who's brain do you love? Right. It's important. Okay. Mm. This is. This is. Mm. This is the thing. You know. This is. This is the bit that gives us all our credibility week in, week out. Mm. It's time for the news, Ben. 
coming to you from the center of Northwestern Europe. Covering board games, war games, card games, and all that shit you love. It's the motherfucking news. <laughs> ben, there's your amazing intro, man. That sets you up every week. <laughs> Dude, tell us the news. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, the first bit of news we're going to be diving into is from Games Workshop, and this is for uh, some new stuff for Age of Sigma. Uh -huh. um, so this weekend we're going to be seeing a new battle tone and also uh, some new terrain for the Seraphon. Right. Uh, so those people that know the Lizardmen from Warhammer Fantasy Battles and the like, uh, you'll know that the Seraphon are now the faction that they're sort of morphed into as they travelled into the mortal realms. Uh, this new battle tome is going to be doing exactly what all the other battle tomes kind of do and diving into a little bit more background and also lots of new tactical options for the Seraphon. One of the interesting things is that there's going to be like sort of two styles of Seraphon. There's going to be the ones that effectively came from the old world and have this almost like uh, ghostly presence to them. They're effectively made up of like star matter, for example. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the slightly more grounded Seraphon who have found themselves taking root within the mortal realms themselves and sort of coalescing a little bit more to become a little bit more like the kind of lizard men of old. They've kind of developed their sort of pyramid structures and their jungles and that kind of thing across all the different realms. Um, as well as the battle tome itself, there's going to be a new terrain piece, as always seems to be the case with these new sort of revamped armies, and that's the Realm Shaper engine. And this is going back to that kind of uh, aesthetic that we saw from the Terraform back in one of the fantasy battles, where we're looking at the kind of like Aztec and Mayan sort of thing going into the mix here. So we've got a ziggurat there that can sort of um, change the winds of magic around your uh, magic users on the battlefield. And it actually allows you to um, sort of mess around with terrain and allows you to sort of damage enemies by using their terrain against them, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, as well as the sort of Seraphon army as a whole, there's also going to be three new start collecting sets. Uh, so with the first of the start collecting sets, is tied directly to the Seraphon, mm -hmm. and that's allowing you to build up an army of skinks. Uh, and then you've also got two more uh, for the Daughters of Cain and for the Gloom Spike Gits as well. So Nice. <laughs> nice. Um, that Daughters of Cain box looks amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one really of the interesting like things about the, the Daughters of Cain one is that it's it looks like... Um, it effectively, it's quite a small set, but the actual um, sort of altar that they have uh, that is sort of part of the kit can actually be broken down into a number of different components, allowing you to create a whole bunch of different um, sort of styles of sort of war machine, effectively, mm -hmm. and also characters at the same time. It's a little bit more of an elite force than you'd probably normally be seeing when it came to like starting to collect a force, but the Daughters of Cain are kind of elite anyway, yeah. uh, so this kind of gives you like a good inroad into exactly what they're all about. I think my favourite, actually, is probably the Gloom Spike to uh, glitz, uh, gits one because I love it. You've got the big, huge rock trogos in the background. I think that's really cool. And the squigs are very much at the sort of heart of the Gloom Spike Gits yeah. as well. So it's a really nice sort of entry into the kind of goblin y style thing in the Mortal Realms as well. There. See, very there's cool. one miniature in this I love above all the others. Mm -hmm. And he's on the, the bottom left at the front. There's a little dude playing a mushroom bagpipe. <laughs> it's called a squig pipe. A squig pipe. Squig pipe. Okay. So I love how the Gloom Spike Gits contain. As few goblins as humanly possible. Yes. <laughs> so, if, what, you want to, if you want to be able to win with this no, faction, four. don't bring the faction. Yes. Bring no, all the people around the faction. Uh -huh. There's only four in the box. Yeah. And one of them is being eaten. Lovely models, though. Gorgeous, Absolutely gorgeous stuff. Models. Um, next up, and this uh, this actually um, will relate well to tomorrow's or Sunday's XLBS. Mm -hmm. We're going to be talking a little bit about why we should only ever play campaign. Mm. Only okay. ever play campaigns, but we'll, we'll talk about that on, on Sunday. What? Uh, <laughs> Only <laughs> ever play campaigns? Yes. Right, Ben, um, on the topic of uh, campaigns, Conquest, um, uh, from the guys at Parabellum, are now releasing z Season Zero of their organized play kit. Yeah, so uh, the guys at Parabellum are really shifting their focus towards getting a lot more people at stores and clubs and things playing Conquest because uh, they've got all the big sort of four main armies out right now and they're building towards additional ones in the future this year, which is very, very cool. But one of the key elements of that is the idea of uh, organized play. And so this Season Zero kit is effectively a way for eight, well, for you and seven of your friends to get involved at a local store and play through an awesome sort of campaign style tournament on the day and try and win some good goodies and prizes and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, the people who come first and second will get themselves a miniature and also like a really awesome deck box for all of your army cards. And then everyone else is going to get things like card sleeves. And there's these really nice tokens that you get, to get in the set as well. And these can then be cashed in at a later date. They haven't explained exactly how for ex extra prizes at slightly larger competitions and that kind of thing at big events. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so if you're thinking like UK Games Expo and that kind of thing, Adepticon, that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, but yeah, a really awesome way to get involved with Conquest, to pick up your starter army and play with your friends at your local store. Excellent. And mm -hmm. um, we'll be taking a closer look at that because um, uh, the, the plans are afoot for four of us to take on the conquest. Mm -hmm. I've already bagsied the hundred kingdoms. Flag them. So <laughs> we, 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 shall, we shall see. But uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. We'll be talking more about that soon. Um, Elder, Scores, Elder Scrolls, sorry. Um, the Cult Arms has went up for pre-order. Um, yeah. Do um, we know what's so, uh, uh, yeah, so the guys at uh, Modifius, uh, we talked about them a couple of weeks ago on the show, but they're now uh, ramped up pre-orders for you to dive into the Elder Scrolls Call to Arms, which is their sort of first season, their first series of content for the Elder Scrolls at large and sort of like Tamriel and that kind of thing. And this is all set in Skyrim and the first couple of sets are based on a starter set which contains all the rules and the tokens and all the all sort of extra gubbins that you need in order to play the game. Mm -hmm. And then you can break it down into start faction for the Imperials, a starter faction for the Nords and also a starter delve kit if you want to try and play the game in more of a solo or cooperative nature. Um, all of the options that they've created for this uh, pre-order are are available in either plastic or resin. The resin sets cost a little bit more, obviously, because it's a little more of an expensive material, but you can dive in and pick whichever one you want and sort of build up your force as you see fit. Of course, everything can be mixed and matched, so if you want to pick up the Imperial stuff and the Delve set, you can use the Imperials as either part of your party or maybe as antagonists that you run into, run into on the way. And of, on top of all of that, they've also done a whole bunch of terrain. Because one of the big things is trying to set up a tabletop that looks and feels like it's set within the world of uh, the Elder Scrolls and Skyrim. And so they've designed some really awesome terrain kits in resin that will allow you to build like the dungeons that you dive into and also some of the extra landscapes and stuff as well. I really like the fact that you've also got some sort of treasure and objective markers in there at the same time too and it helps to bring that sort of character to say for example a battle map, you flick a couple of these onto the tabletop and suddenly you're suddenly you're in Skyrim adventuring down into one of the, uh, the barrows or something in search of treasure. But uh, a really cool and extensive looking release stuff at the moment and they've got loads of stuff planned for the rest of uh, the year as well. Yeah, there we go. Very cool. Um, uh, SPQR. We have a, we have Dacians, and how do I pronounce this? Sarmatians. Sarmatians. Yeah. Yeah. Your Sarmatians. They're. Mm, see if you hit the Black Sea. Yes. And you run around the top of the Black Sea into Ukraine. Northern Europe. Yeah. And yeah. That neck of the woods. So the Dacians would be the sort of Ukraine, and then just into the bottom of Russia would be the Sarmatians. So they're both uh -huh. very similar. Nomadic armies, they sort of came out of the Scythians. Mm -hmm. I, want Scythian. I want to say Scythian Empire. So, um, a lot of the cataphract cavalry and stuff like that, you know, the big yeah. full armoured cav, uh -huh. they were Dacian summations. Trajan's column, the famous column in Rome, mm -hmm. Emperor Trajan had erected, was because of the wars he fought against those two. Yeah. So, they're like one of Rome's main or most famous enemies for the Imperials. Mm -hmm. And that's why we trust Jerry. That, uh, that's why we trust Jerry. Right, so... Um, yeah, can Jerry do history? Of course he can. There's four new sets, Ben. Uh, give us a look at them. Yeah, so uh, this is a new set, obviously, of additional sort of content that you can use in uh, SPQR, but you could also use it in the likes of Hail Caesar as well if you wanted to as well. Each of the different kits has been designed using their, um, their sort of new material they have for SPQR, which is a little bit more of a resin than it is um, anything else. And a lot of their ranges has existed before in metal, but it's kind of transitioning over into a new material for use in the skirmish game and the like. Uh, you can either get yourself a set of nobles, which are sort of all on foot and clad in slightly heavier armour, You've also got tribesmen with javelins, uh, some horse archers, and also a Scorpio team as well if you want to get uh, sort of be laying down a little bit of artillery fire as you're fighting on the battlefield. Um, it seems like a really interesting sort of dynamic and mobile force. Uh, so maybe if your friend's playing Romans, you can sort of get the drop of them on them and sort of like go around the flanks and, you know, harass them from behind on the side as well and sort of get the, get the number up on them and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, a really interesting looking uh, sort of set of uh, releases uh, for SBQR that take you in a little bit of a different direction from the kind of Romans and Gauls that we've been seeing as, as the games sort have of started out last year. So, Love them. Love them. Mm. Right, on the topic of historical, I think it's time to melt Justin's mind. What? So, Justin. Yeah? You know that, yes, I like to melt your mind. Yeah. But I also like to expand your mind and expand 
your gaming possibilities. Yeah, see, here, here's the problem. Whenever you're melting my mind, it's not normally when you're trying to melt my mind, it's when you try to expand my mind. So this is why I'm nervous of this particular segment. Okay. 2,721 years ago. Okay. Modern history then. So we're going, we're going a little ways back in time. Okay. To the year 701 BC. E. Okay. Okay. You've got to get the E in there just to, just to, you know. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Historical accuracy. I even have notes because I don't want to miss anything in this. Right. This, so, so from all of the, the expertly written sources from this time period. Eh. You know the way I have been kind of banging the drum yeah. for what I believe will be the greatest hobby game ever. Yeah, you, you're doing your If Carlsberg Made a Game. Yes, but if I made a game, it would be the greatest game ever. And the one I've been banging my drum about now for some years mm. is Bible Wars. Bible Wars, okay. Okay, because I think it is the, the Old Testament is the perfect setting for war games. There's plenty in there. Okay. And, and so in this mind melter uh -huh. or mind expander, it, I'm going to give you something so juicy, okay. so historically magnificent, right. you'll barely be able to sit in your chair. Right. Right. 701 BCE. Yeah. The Assyrians. Mm -hmm. Assyrians, okay? Yeah, uh, yeah, the Assyrians, I got it. They are a totally badass civilization mm -hmm. uh, that by this stage control a big chunk of the Middle Middle East. The Middle Middle East? The okay. Middle Middle East. Middle of the Middle East, right the middle, in the middle, or is it in the, the middle before you get to the middle? No, it is. Or is, it's it kind of, is it after the middle? It's kind of in the Middle Middle. Okay. Yeah, but the middle middle has to be either perfect, perfect the central, or the, the before the middle middle, the after the middle middle, or the middle middle. One of them. They have the largest standing armor or uh, army right. ever okay. to this point in history. Okay. No one has had a larger standing army um, by this point. Okay. And they have a reputation for being really, really cruel. Okay. Right. And they were feared in that oh, area. Right, so this is why they have the biggest standing army in history, because they know people don't like them. Basically, the way, the way history kind of transpired, there was an opportunity for them to become an em a little empire of their own, mm. and they took it. Okay. Sargon II has died. Right. Ish. He's on his way out. Okay. He's nearly dead. And it's his better. And his son, okay. Uh, Sargon III? They have a new king. No. He's called Sennacherib. Sennacherib, okay. Say it, say it with me. Sennacherib. Okay. Yes, that's it. Babylon, Iraq, yeah. Jerusalem, mm -hmm. Judah, yeah, yeah. decide now is a good time to basically kind of try and cut ties with the Assyrians and rebel a little bit mm. and go, well, you're a new leader, you're untested, we're going to, you know, be the big men. Right. Let's see who they were dealing with. Right. Sennacherib um, left quite a lot of writings behind because right. the Assyrians and the, the peoples of that time, mm. they wrote in cuneiform. Yeah. Okay. Cuneiform. So there's a thing, booby traps, that's what I said. <laughs> so <laughs> there's, a, there's a, something called the Sennacherib prison, prism, and it's kind of like a triangular piece of stone right. with, with writings in it. Here are some of Sennacherib's direct quotes. I cut off their lives like one cut string. Okay. My prancing steeds, harness for riding, plunged into the streams of their blood as if into a river. So I, it, it loses a little something in translation, especially translation through Warren. And of course, my personal favorite, and you will appreciate this one. Right. Their testicles I cut off and tore their penises like the seeds of cucumbers in June. What the hell? Where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> what the? Oh my god, the smell of it. At least no see cucumber. Oh. Sniff my cucumber, man. <laughs> Get away with that. I'm intimidated already. <laughs> I didn't even see him come in with that thing. Where did, where, He's been oh, honestly, where did you hide that? I mean, like, where have you unsheathed? 
that from? Best not ask questions you don't want to hear answers to. Yeah. yeah. Good flavour on that one. Anyway. He was a bad dude. Yeah, and your bad breath is seriously bad, you bad dude. <sighs> That's wrong with cucumber. Smells so, wrong. So, um, Sennacherib decided, I'm not taking this shit. Right. I'm going to sort this out. Right. So Babylon fell. And the king of Babylon at the time got the Sennacherib treatment. I think he ripped his head off. Nice. And they stuck his head on a tree and... Yeah, it's, it's the yeah. best way. Yeah, I assume that's their equivalent version of Twitter. Mm -hmm. He then marched on Judah, mm. okay, and basically crushed a number of cities in mm. Judah, um, cities around Jerusalem. He didn't mm. go directly to Jerusalem, but he went on to Judah and started to crush a, a number of cities, mm. okay? Right. Jerusalem at the time was ruled by King Hezekiah. Say it with me. Hezekiah. Hezekiah. Yeah. And he knew that they were in deep shit. Mm -hmm. So he set about working on the defenses of Jerusalem for right. a siege. Mm -hmm. okay. And there was basically two main tracks to that. Pray like you've never prayed before. Uh -huh. And he built a tunnel. A tunnel. A tunnel. So he built a tunnel. Where, I think a tunnel where, was, from where to? was over a mile long. Okay. So this is what he did. He went out and they blocked up all of the springs and all of the fresh water uh, areas around the city of Jerusalem. Genius. Right. He then sent two teams to dig a tunnel and they managed to get it to meet in the middle. Right. Okay. Now imagine, mm. you know, we did the channel tunnel, not me and you personally. Well, yeah, maybe me and oh. you personally, but that you know, was no mean feat. Yeah. That tunnel, each of them went 500, 600 odd meters mm. and they managed to meet in the middle. He then diverted a stream so that fresh water came through the tunnel uh -huh. and into the city of Jerusalem. Clever man. So that yeah. they had, had some fresh water. Aqueduct. Because yeah. the thing about a siege is it's all about how long you Reasons, can hold yeah. out. And can you make it difficult for your enemy to hold out? Yeah. That tunnel still exists today. Right. And water still runs through that tunnel today. That's impressive. When we go on our crusade, we'll check out his tunnel. Nice. I'll right. go in the front, you go in the back, all right? Wait, I have to check out the back passage? Why? You like that. Would you like a piece of cucumber? No, get it away. <laughs> so he diverted the water uh, into it. The Assyrians then arrived at Jerusalem. And basically to try and scare, the, they, they were there to scare the, the people that were in it. They sent people up who talked a lot of smack talk. I imagine they waved cucumbers around in the air. They would. See, you know, it's yeah, like, see that, that length of time ago, would the cucumber have been the same? Well, meanwhile, mm. little, a little bit further west, in Egypt, uh -huh. Egypt at this stage was controlled by Ethiopians. Okay. Okay. And they had a pharaoh who was a really cool dude. Right. So this was an Ethiopian chap who was the pharaoh at that time, and his name was Taharka. Say it with me. Taharka. Taharka. <laughs> so these guys were called the Kushites. Okay. They Kushites. Were, they were the Kush. I can get on with these guys. So I'm pretty chill. The Kushites, and they were actually very deeply respected throughout the region. And the Kushites uh, in the biblical texts mm. are always talking about, uh, spoken about in a positive, a positive mm. light. You didn't muck around well, with these guys. I, I, I'm assuming no negative waves. The Kushites thought, we're not having this because the Assyrians are just going to keep going until they kick our asses as yeah, well. Right. We're going to get stuck in and help Judah. Right. Now, this is where the story takes a strange turn. Mm. So, the siege failed mm. for the Assyrians. And I have three accounts to tell you about. Okay. I have the biblical account, right. as wrote by the people in Jerusalem. Right. Um, I have Sennacherib, Sennacherib's account himself right. of what happened. And then I have what the Egyptians said happened. So, so these three... Main forces yeah. all come together. Yeah. The only thing they all agreed on is that Jerusalem wasn't taken. Right. But let's hear what happened. Okay. In the biblical account, right. they said that Yahweh yeah. sent an angel of God called the Destroyer. Mm -hmm. And he was sent during the night to the Assyrian camp 
where he proceeded to slaughter 185,000 soldiers. Okay. Um, it's told that Sennacherib and the survivors woke up just to find bodies everywhere. Mm. And Sennacherib thought, maybe it's time to head home. Yep. Okay. Okay. So that's the biblical account of an angel, basically the destroyer. This is a well-known angel, the destroyer. That is yeah. his actual name, the destroyer. Yeah. Um, he he's killed a lot of uh, a lot of Israelites and stuff as well. But on this occasion, yeah, he went and ripped it to the Assyrians. Okay. On Sennacherib's prism mm -hmm. that I was telling you about, that prism, as well as having his best quotes. I have to ask, how big is this prism? How girthy? It's a beautiful piece. Okay. It's a beautiful piece. As well as having his best quotes about cucumbers and yeah, various yeah, yeah. other phallic-like plants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's all about his conquests. Right. And he talks about every city that he sieged and overtook. Yeah. Until it comes to Jerusalem, where he basically says, and I quote, They paid me lots of goodies. They gave me lots of slaves. So I left. Triumphant. Yay me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds legit. This was strange because every other city that he uh, sieged, mm. he took and he basically led slaughter upon yeah. it. Okay? Did any of them try to surrender before and give them lots of goodies and lots of slaves? I'm sure many of them w w would know that they were all going to end up in slaves. Yeah. But in this one, apparently, um, he talks about uh, Hezekiah giving him um, is eunuchs and oh, yeah, okay. his aunches and okay. stuff like yeah, that there. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Anyway, but he admits that he didn't take Jerusalem, mm. okay? But he still tries to make the best of a bad day, okay? Well, if, if he's getting away, he hasn't had to fight, and he's got lots of goodies and lots of slaves, that's still a pretty good day. If it happened, yeah. 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 He, he's not the only king in the past who's yeah, yeah, blurred yeah. the truth. Yeah. And they've lost terribly. So, yeah. um... Do you want to hear what the Egyptians had to say? Yeah, go on. Let's see what the so, Egyptians say. Because they're, they're not in the fight. They're just watching from the side. You know, popcorn's out, I'm guessing. The Egyptians, you, you would think, you know, they're the impartial third, third party in mm. all of this, yeah. right? Herodotus, mm. okay, he was an ancient Greek historian. Father of history. Mm -hmm. Right. He went to Egypt, and the Egyptians told him this story of what happened. Right. The pharaoh, Taharka. Taharka, yeah. Yeah. Um, was deeply worried about this, mm. and he prayed harder than he ever prayed before. Okay. And then he got a vision from whichever gods or whatever he was praying to. Could have been one of a few, mind you. Probably Ra or something. And the vision, the god said, you're going to be all right, son. I've got this. Don't worry. Okay. All right. Then... An army of mice attacked the Assyrians. And it ate their leather stuff, it ate their bowstrings and their quivers, leaving them unable to fight. So you can imagine all their little leather cod pieces and stuff, yeah, yeah, full out. of holes, yeah, falling yeah, off, yeah, no yeah, means yeah, of keeping yeah, the pants yeah, yeah. up. Maybe it was a combo. Maybe the Egyptian god got there first, sent a swarm of mice, took out all of their armor and ways to defend themselves. And when, when the destroyer arrived, easy meat. Easy meat yeah. for the destroyer. Mm. You know, I reckon all these accounts are true. Yeah. Mm. Apparently, <laughs> how many pages do you have? Apparently, mm -hmm. Herodotus even saw a statue of the Pharaoh. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this statue still exists today, but Herodotus saw it and it was of the Pharaoh in his Egyptian style, but one slight difference. Mm -hmm. He had his hand out. There's a little mouse on it. And in his hand, he had a little mouse. Right. In his hand. I don't think the statue exists today, but I'm fairly certain I've seen a carving um, well, I've on, holding on a temple a wall with, with mouse out. Okay. So, yeah. so, wait, mouse out or mouse out? Mouse out. Okay. Mouse out. Tell me, mm. Bible Wars is going to be the best game you have ever played. Yeah, yeah, you could have fun with that. It's going to be amazing, man. So, 
I was thinking about this, right? It, even this scenario within Bible Wars, there's three amazing armies. Mm -hmm. So you could build up a kind of like an Israelite kind of yeah, an yeah, army yeah. Um, of the Hebrews. You have the Assyrians who are going to be totally badass, man. Yeah. And then you have uh, the Egyptian slash Ethiopian mm. Cushites. Yeah. And then that's just three, dude. So, there were Babylonians and everything in that period. Hittites, mm -hmm. Sea Peoples. Yeah, so the, the question is then, so f would you actually have the miracles happening from each god? Hell yes. I was thinking you could have an army of mice, uh, okay? <laughs> um, and what we could have is imagine the destroyer on the tabletop. Right, so okay. Yeah, I, I, I imagine the destroyer. Here's Warren on a, you know, a high jump. Whee! Well, think about it. This is where we use our creative juices. Yeah. If, do you need any creative no. juices? Okay. <laughs> Put it so, away. Down, boy. This is a classic race against time war game. Right. Now, me and you have played something similar of a race, and, a race against time war game. Right. Can you remember what it was? Probably Waterloo or something. Exactly. The Destroyer is our buddy of the Prussians. What do we call that, gentlemen? Blucher. Blucher. So it's basically Blucher the Destroyer. Yeah. So what we need to do is you create a war game right. where we beat seven shades of shite out of each other before yeah. the Destroyer yeah. or the Mouse Army arrive. So in other words, you know what would have happened, the classic what-if scenario... <laughs> Excuse me. Corona. Don't worry. Yeah. Corona. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I've, I've not been exposed just yet. The classic... Um, war game uh, scenario of or, or the classic what if scenario mm. of if Sennacherib had decided to just do it rather than wait you know there, there was yeah. there was very little reason for him to take a lot of those other cities he could have went there quicker he could have just piled in right. but you know he obviously he turned around to try and face the Egyptians and stuff he got distracted mm. here's the interesting thing is this a, um, an interesting already? Well, this is an interesting historical what if. Okay. Can you imagine what it would be like today mm. if Sennacherib had have succeeded in his assault on Jerusalem? What would be the major changes today? Well, Christianity would be completely different. Uh, in what way? Well, you're, you wouldn't have then had, oh, what was the king at the time Jesus was born? Herod? Uh -huh. He wouldn't have been king at the time. It would have been a different dynasty. So instantly, the one who was hunting for him is no longer there. If, almost, I, if I remember, you're almost there. Yeah. Let me let me let me set just exactly okay, what the ahead. difference. If he'd went there and slaughtered, yeah, okay, as he had the pattern of doing, yeah, there would be no Abrahamic religions whatsoever today. Really, Judaism would be gone. And Judaism led to Christianity. There yeah. would be no Christianity. All right, so uh, okay, th would this be, now makes sense why you were would, talking about Yahweh. There would be, be no, Islam. no Islam either. Really? Interesting. They are all Abrahamic um, uh, okay. based religions. There would be none of that. Okay. We'd all be shagging bulls and stuff like that today. But, you know, for some of us, that's no bad thing. <laughs> Very true. Uh, it's um, it, this this pivotal battle if it wasn't for either the mice or, or the, the lord or the, <laughs> or the payoff you know the, the or the payoff with his eunuchs and whatever yeah, yeah, else yeah. this world of ours would be very different would be very different would it be better nice. i don't know it would maybe be mad max kind of style <laughs> every man for himself kind of a thing well you know there well i was going to say you might still have the old norse religions kicking about but they've actually just revived it yeah i'm wondering what would happen with rome because Rome going into standalone Judea is one thing. Mm -hmm. Rome attempting to get into essentially a massive Assyrian, uh, Assyrian yeah. empire that stretches mm -hmm. from, you know, the, the, well, the shores of Jerusalem all the way across to... Uh, because Egypt Iraq. would be gone as well. Yeah. Yeah. Egypt couldn't stand against the Assyrians if they held Jerusalem. They would have just rolled on. Yeah. Would Rome even have got off the ground at that point then? <laughs> it depends how far they decide to push. Yeah. Mm. It's... Um, it's this one battle. Yeah, it could have changed the world. Could have changed everything to this point. Interesting, and that's not, that's how pivotal. I'm gonna say it's Bible a mind Wars expander, is. not a mind melter. This week. Yeah. Well, nicely you know, done. It, it, I think Bible Wars is going to be the greatest war game I've ever created. 
coming to Kickstarter soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, that's your story for today. Yeah. Post what you think. Even more news, bitches. And you thought we were done for news? No way, man. We love Ben. Ben, give it to me, man. Give it to me. <laughs> yeah, so uh, sticking with the sort of historical theme, uh, we've also got some new stuff coming out of War Games Atlantic. Uh, the pre orders are now live uh, for both their Dark Age Irish, which can be used in obviously. No, Dark just Age wait, games just wait, just wait, medieval. just wait. You've got to cut to me and Jerry. <laughs> oh, these are awesome! <laughs> Dark oh, Age Irish. Wow, my I, ear. And not just because I'm on the sprue, apparently. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> not, uh, is that sort in here? No, it's not wow. in here. Okay. okay. And is it on their main website? No, no, it's no, it's in Facebook. Uh, oh. we, 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 it's not just because the, the Cullen himself is on the sprue. It's just <laughs> cool to see it. And look at the models, Justin. Bring yeah, the yeah. models up. All right, do you, do you want me to embiggen? Yes. Embiggen away, man. Look there at you them. Go. Embiggened. They are awesome. Look at that dude with Hang the... Hang on, I'm in there. Well, there's Jerry in the background. Look, right in the middle at the oh, back. Yeah, yes, oh, yeah. and I'm just in front of him. <laughs> He's yeah. there in the middle at the back. He's, this is in your younger days, Jerry, yeah, when you're yeah, when slightly less, more colour. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And it just that is you yeah, in the I'm middle. Yeah, I'm just in front of him if I grew out the beard again. Yeah, that weird brain-damaged looking one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and there's a younger, skinnier you on the right. You could put, you could melt two of them together, and it would look more like me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but oh, I love it, man. You know, this is uh, that Mohican, that Mohican, man. Yeah, I am desperate to get oh, a no. Mohican. Are, are you want wanting? To, to, are you still wanting to do the Vikings haircut? Yes, yes. I want, I want it all kind of shaved in there. <sighs> Andrea won't let me. <laughs> do you reckon? Uh, could I? Could I get? Could I get? Okay, so I know what I need. So here's the plan. The next time we do an event, you're getting Warren very, very drunk, and you're letting me out with the clippers. No, yeah, I don't need to be drunk. You need to get Andrea very, very drunk to give me the permission. <laughs> or we can we probably could, manage that. We could start one of those UK. She's only one of those UK. Here, don't underestimate Andrea. I did it once, <laughs> and I just about got away with it, man. <laughs> <laughs> we could start up one of them UK parliamentary petitions. <laughs> hey, Warren said. And, and if I pass the link around, even if I just got the people I know on Facebook to sign it, see, that might be enough to swear. But that haircut's past being cool now. Because you see it everywhere. Yeah, that's I, exactly I why I, thought, I need to get it. Oh, maybe I'll get something like that at some point. And then I yeah. looked around and went, no, nah, everyone's got that haircut now. Now, you could do that's it for it. charity. <clears throat> that might be the way to swing it with Andrea. Children in need? When does it come up in the year? Mm. I might shave my beard. I, I actually had an uncle who got himself shaved like me one time for children in need. My aunt was not best pleased. We, we came out and it was just him in the back of the car with his shirt wrapped around his head. <laughs> Sorry, yep, I, the same thing was going through my mind as it was going through all of your minds. But we'll say nothing more. <laughs> <laughs> so not just Dark Age Irish then, Ben? Yes, yes. Yeah. so what else is there, Ben? <laughs> uh, so as, as well as the 30 man and 10 dog uh, nice. unit of plastic troops for the Dark Age Irish, there's also a 40 man plastic kit for the Afghan warriors as well. Uh, these can be used in games set sort of in the 1800s and 1900s, but also they have said that you could take it back into the 1700s as well. Um, as I was saying, this one's a 40 man kit, so it comes with 40 uh, guys in there. You can build a fair fairly sizable force with for skirmish games and mass battle if you wanted to as well. They come armed with the likes of um, swords and shields and they've also got guns and rifles and that kind of thing too as well. So lots of really awesome plastics on the way in that sense as well. To be on fair, Ben, of... anybody that's playing Spectre could probably rock them out as well. well <laughs> you yeah, know, I'm exactly looking at them and I'm going, here, uh, you know, compared to what we saw on the TV back during those <laughs> Afghanistan <laughs> days. You know, there's, there's not a lot of change there. So. They're rocking. Uh, do you know yeah. what though? Do you know look? I do you know what I think would be kind of interesting to imperial guard those bad boys up. Mm. You yeah, you could do that. that. Yeah, Wouldn't cool. that be interesting oh, to do the... Talon Desert Raiders? But, there you mm -hmm. go. but then they already have that sort of Napoleonic box set that they do. Yes. Mm. So this oh, would so be the other be one. part of it. No, this would be just a, another Imperial Guard style, the Talon Desert Raiders or something. Or, yeah, or they, a unit they, they, they used to have the Rough Riders. Yeah. The Talaran Rough Riders. Yeah, they were the cavalry unit for the Imperial Guard. Uh huh. They only came in afterwards, though. Yeah. Because uh -huh. they used to have um, oh, Cossack-looking ones first. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Either way, I, you know, I, I'm just all about something just a bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 
and that could be that's just it could be something could be cool. that you just don't often see. So, yeah, what else have we got? Uh, one of the other really cool things that they've been doing recently, and it's one of the cool things about War Games Atlantic as a, as a company, really, is they tend to sort of ask the community what you want to see them do next. Yeah, they're and so they held a way. poll this um, sort of this sort of week, uh, sort of asking what people want to see, and they were taking uh, examples from all over the place. Like there could have been Maori miniatures, British miniatures from the same period. There could have been some slightly more modern stuff as well. Mm-hmm. But it all came down to a winner that came out. So they're going to be doing box sets for conquistadors and aztecs so we're going to be able to see that conflict play now Plastic and as jerry was talking to me about this mm. earlier in the week yeah, it's a bunch of plastic miniatures that we don't re- we don't really see no. that often um, so very very cool stuff they actually have a teaser for the conquistador mm, they, said, yeah. they said somebody to work right off the bat <laughs> so you can do your uh, Cities of Gold and El Dorado and yeah. Mm-hmm. Went so they have Aztecs nice. to go with it. No, well, they well, they're going to work on them. They're going to work on yes. them. Mm-hmm. I was gutted because I think between the first, second, and third, there was only a few percent. You know, a couple of dozen votes, not even hundreds, a couple of dozen. And well, the, um, the numbers tr- are here. The Trojan versus Mycenaean, so oh. the Trojan Wars came a close second. That would have been. Cool. Yeah, that would. Um, who else have we got in there? We have the French Foreign Legion versus. I imagine the. Yeah, and the U.S. Army versus the Sioux. Sioux yeah. yeah. So yeah, the um, conquistadors beat out the Trojans. Maori versus British would have been interesting, though. Yeah, that would have been cool. I got something to say. Yes, I've got a request. Mm. Right, I like box sets, uh, so uh, that um, are kind of multi-use. Yeah. Right, that. Um, that you could look at it like like the the Afghans yeah. that we were looking at there. You know, you can start to think of, ooh, I could use that in a different way, right? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I love my fantasy armies. Yes. Right. I um, have been on the lookout for some really cool English Civil War guys. Mm. That have a kind of a witch hunter kind of a look to them. So what? Mm. Where the roses sort of with the, with the, the Solomon Kean yeah, feel. Yeah, that kind of um, Van Helsing kind of a yeah. look, you know. So um, I don't know, you know, War Games Atlantic, if you ever fancy doing uh, stuff like that. There may be a there may be a load of this stuff out there. I haven't seen a lot of it, but it Warlord would be... do some plastic um, English Civil War that should do the trick. Yeah, loose anyway. So with the berries yeah, of it's just a, it's just a, just oh, a plastics. little request okay. in there, when, just to throw my <clears throat> top in. When these um, polls happen and they've mm. got a result, is it for one box or is it for? Do they do a two or three boxes based on what wins? What, at, what happens at, there? Because are the they going to end up with a range of? There's one box of this, one box of that, one box of this, one box of that, or is there multi boxes? At, at the moment, it's, it looks like one box, but um, because they've done the the grognards. And it was the second of their sci-fi boxes. The first one was the Realm Jaeger. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they had a little poll. It was like, what do you want to see next? And people actually just went, you know what? We'd actually like to see like heavy weapons and commands for the Grognards. To, mm. So I can, if I want to do a full army of your stuff, I can do a full army. So they've started working on a French artillery piece, sci-fied up a bit um, for them. So this, even though it, it looks like it's just going to be conquistadors and Aztecs, I think they're starting to take that on board where if they do branch out into the more unusual um, or esoteric that you can't get other bits of, that they will do multiple boxes if it's worthwhile. Mm. So conquistadors, they may do cab for them, maybe not. They didn't have a huge amount, a lot of them died. Uh, Aztecs didn't really use it. So I think they may just be two separate boxes and that will do them. I think the conquistadors took the guns off their ships uh, whenever they decided to take over all of Mexico. Mm. Um, well, so Cortes might, burnt the ships, didn't they? So they, they, couldn't, yeah, return, so they couldn't return. So they probably did take the guns so, off it. So <laughs> you might get artillery pieces from them, but yeah. it's really they're, they're trying to find these little niches where they can just sort of fit in. So if you're looking for sort of movies and things to get into, what is this like? Is this apocalypto type? No, no that's that's the Aztecs on themselves uh, there, and stuff, there, isn't there, it? There was actually a oh god, I can't remember the name of the film though. I think Lars von Trier may have directed it, but there is actually one about Cortez butchering his way through Central America. Mm-hmm. Um, but if, yeah. you, if you know when you're watching, put in some, drop in some yeah, ideas drop in the, the comments. comments. Drop, drop yeah. in comments. Also, yeah. there'll, be, there'll be foreign language ones out there that chances are I've never seen and a lot of other people mm-hmm. haven't. Because you always find that you get these absolute gems and it yeah. may be that it's never been translated from Spanish. So if you don't mm-hmm. mind subtitles, you can 
find some great films that way yeah. as well. Um, I've used the subtitles, so not a big issue. I try all that hentai, hentai. stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right, I've a, a, he never a, gets it. An obvious request. An obvious request. Mm. Clearly, if Bible Wars is going to be a thing, mm. um, I, I'm going to need minis for that. But I have already decided that Bible Wars will be 15 mil. Ooh. Because um, 15 mil is the most awesome scale in the world. Is it your new God scale? It is my new God scale. And do you want to know why it's my new God scale, right? Mm. Because been, it's Bible Wars? I have been playing a lot, yeah. I've been playing a lot with the scales recently, but the whole 3D printing we've been, we're testing down to, to 2 mil, right? Mm. 2 mil is ridiculous. 2 mil is an it's utterly super. ridiculous scale. Oh, magical. I think that 2 mil is basically um, the grognard's thumb in the nose scale. I think I think basically somebody's come up with 2 mil just to show how ridiculous it can be. That's for when you don't have the space to play a 2 foot square DBM game. Yeah. You can scale it down to 2 mil and play it on a 1 foot square. You can say that, but <laughs> having seen the 2 mil scale, i am still got sore eyes. From trying to see it. I gotta admit, I'm with this. Like I don't want to pee anybody off about it, but the two mil scale, I look at it, and you said something about, oh, you could just use computer chips. Turn yes. it upside down with all the pins. No, yeah, you, yeah, you just get you just get microprocessors. But, but then that's only for the skirmishers. <laughs> <machine. laughs> because when you've got a rank, it's more like like a block that, uh -huh. that looks like it's got multiple people all with their pikes or spears yeah. above their heads, so you get like a three dimensional depth to it. Uh, so so you, you can't use pins. Uh, but you I, I think I'm content saying, with my bigger skill stuff. Mm -hmm. You were also saying it comes into its own when you've got war elephants and, and four horse chariots, chariots and, and stuff, things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Anyway. from there you get to six mil. Mm. No, six mil. Oh, poser scale. I'm starting to, <laughs> I'm starting to get a look at. Okay, I like as I said, I have an idea for six mil for to do San Nazir because with San Nazir I could actually do it one to one mm. with the two hundred and fifty odd commandos yeah. mm. and the five thousand Germans. Okay. <laughs> See, my, my question for any of these game types, Warren, is is have you played a game of it in that scale? Because I remember when you used to not like fifteen mil. Until you actually played a 15 mil game, you didn't like it. Then you played it, and then you loved it. Yes. So I would say reserve your judgment until you've played six mil and played two mil. Uh, I don't know if I can see well enough to play two mil. However, six mil is good. Mm. But for me now, the crowning scale is 15 mil. And the reason is every base is a diorama. Mm. Even your little small 32 mil bases are holding two or three guys on it and every base can tell a little story, and you just get that sense of the weight of numbers, mm. um, that historical kind of battles, and certainly Bible Wars, needs. Like fantasy games and sci-fi games, you know, uh, one figure to one base, yeah, I can see that, and, uh, uh, and that's fine. But it wasn't until Jerry kindly introduced me to the whole Tiny Fighting Little Men's and the Crusades, mm -hmm. where he started to multi-base 15 mil figures down and then when I did it myself I look at it and I am utterly in love with 15 mil multi-based and mm. and because you don't even in flames of war you don't see that you normally have maybe a couple of platoons and you know the rest of it is all the tanks and stuff like that so you never it never completely tw tw twigs for you mm. the just the 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 beauty of the 15 mil scale when it, it when it is well, all multi base, it'd be so. really cool for the Ark of the Covenant because <clears throat> mm -hmm. you've got your wee dudes carrying it. Yep, and then you can have a tornado coming out of the top of it, and the lid at the top of the tornado. Yeah, makes and sense. Melted face in and there some somewhere. Melted faces, yep. Yep. just wee puddles around it. No, I'm telling you, man. <laughs> Bible Wars, 15 mil, all multi based. When you see that on a tabletop mm. of the Assyrians gearing up. And then the Kushites coming in, and the Mesopotamians. Is there any Babylonians in And the, the Marmadukians. <laughs> yeah. There'll be Babylonians, yeah. Mm. They're all in there, all those big, fearsome things, man. And at 15 mil, it's going to look yeah. amazing. And Every base is a diorama. And Gozer the Gozerian. Gozer the Gozerian. <laughs> the, yeah, the, man, cats and dogs on the same base together. It's going to be great. Oh, God, man. <laughs> it's going to be great. Uh, what the hell were we talking about anyway? We, we were talking about... War Games Atlantic, yes. yes. Make 15 mil Bible Wars, <laughs> and I will cut you in on the world's greatest game 
that will ever be made. <laughs> You'll love it, man. It's, it's, it's going to be a winner. It's going to be a winner. Chicken dinner. Right, Ben, what's next? Uh, so next up, we've got the guys at uh, Al Palasorian Games, who were the guys behind uh, Cyberpunk. Yeah. And their new edition of the game called Cyberpunk Red. Well, they've teamed up with uh, Monster Fight Club to create a range of Cyberpunk Red miniatures for you to use. Uh, they're going to be covering sort of all the bases when it comes to the different archetypes and classes in the game. So you've got fixers, solos, and all that kind of thing, bounty hunters, rocker boys, rocker girls, etc. Everything being thrown into the mix uh, based on sort of an interesting, slightly more heroic and comic art style, which I think is interesting there. Uh, but they're also going to be doing male and female versions of all the different characters. And um, Monster Fight Club also said in the comments of the, the new section where we put this up, they're not only going to be working on miniatures, but they're going to be doing things like vehicles and terrain and maps and all sorts of different things to kind of bring the entire world of Cyberpunk Red to, to life. And they may even be doing some kind of skirmishy stuff with it as well, which would be quite interesting too. Uh, so it's not just going to be a range that dedicates itself to the role-playing game, but potentially a wider collection at the same time. Uh, all the miniatures looking very cool. I do like a little bit of Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk Red sounds really awesome. I've seen some of the gameplay of the demo kit that sort of comes out in the start set and that kind of thing. And that should be available to a lot more people very, very soon as well, which is really good. A really nice sort of like guideline and sort of uh, way into exploring the Cyberpunk world that's going to be eventually coming out in video game form as well. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to be translating from video games to the tabletop from that at the same time. So this allows you to sort of you know, paint up your own characters and use them on the tabletop at the same time. But looking really cool and uh, some nice stuff there from uh, Monster Fight Club. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Our last piece of news, Tales of the, from the Loop has got a starter set. Now Tales from the Loop is coming to Amazon, isn't it? It's yep. Amazon Prime, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the guys at uh, Free Elegan uh, are the people who created the role-playing game based on the artwork of a man whose name I'm going to badly uh, uh, pronounce, but Simon Stalenhag. I think I got that pretty good. Stullen. Uh, but what? But Stullenhag. Stullenhag? Stullenhag. Mm. Uh, but his artwork inspired them to create this game, which is very much sort of like the idea of um, solving mysteries and weird scientific goings on in this place uh, around the loop, which is this scientific um, research center up in the north. In, uh, in the Nordic regions where strange oddities happen, robots are around, all that kind of things like that. M little mysteries mean that people go missing and the kids have to get involved to try and find out what's happened to and things. But because obviously the TV series is coming out, uh, the guys at Free League and decided to create themselves a starter set, which is about half the price of getting the core book and allows you to dive into the game uh, with a whole bunch of archetypes and follow a new storyline just to get you going in it. Because yeah. um, a lot of people are coming and actually playing a lot more role-playing games nowadays thanks yes. to the, you know, the growth of D&D &D and all that kind of thing. At the same time. Um, so this this starter set will come with an illustrated rulebook which teaches you how to play. You'll also have a complete adventure in there, as I was saying, which is called the Recycled Boy. Uh, there's going to be five pre-generated characters in there, so you get to play as kids who are trying to solve these mysteries, think stranger things, if you want a kind of comparison to that. Mm -hmm. and there's also going to be a really nice full colour map. I do love myself a map, and also some engraved dice as well, so you can sort of roll some really nicely themed dice to go along with it all. Um, as I said, it's a little bit of a cheaper option to dive in and play the game to begin with, and then if you like it, you can pick up the main rule book and sort of take your adventures a little bit further. There's also, if anyone is um, familiar with Tales from the Loop and wants to take it a little bit further on than that, there's an additional book that came out called Tales from the Flood, which actually has you playing as teenagers, well, sort of slightly older teenagers rather than young kids, and it sort of continues the storyline and gets a little bit more gritty and dark. Uh, but if you want to dive in and follow the TV series, then this starts say it's going to be coming out very, very soon in order to allow you to do that. So yeah, I'm waiting awesome. on Tales from a Retirement Home. That's the one I'm waiting for. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, in Warzan's game company, mm. after Bible Wars becomes the world's biggest success, the sequel, <laughs> mm. well, Time Bandits the RPG. Nice. <laughs> All right, I thought you were going to do Retirement Home Wars. No, 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 no. Time Bandits the RPG. Think. Ben says he loves a map. Yes. It was all about the all map. About the map. Mm. And, so. if, and if you smushed it up with Robocop, you could have Time Bandits versus Ed 209s. Sorted. We need That's to get these boys over to the Hollywood there. or something. But that think is. about it, right? Time Bandits, the RPG, I would design it that every box, the map in it, is unique. Mm. Right? Mm. And your RPG is you have to follow the map that's in your box. Mm. So procedurally generated maps with procedurally generated names from keywords that I have chosen. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be amazing. There was a game I saw years and years ago now. It was an online RPG, right? But oh, it's an app. 
no, no. <laughs> the way it did it, though, was that where you were role playing was actually where you actually are in the world. So it used like Google Earth yes. to show you where your map was. Uh huh. And it, so it was all based around your local town. Ooh. That sounds kind of boring. Yeah. I, who well, wants, no, to, who I, wants to role play in their own town, though? Not if you live in Strabanistan. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Justin. Yes. Got a treat for you. Okay. Will you join me? Yeah, sure. Let's go Warren meets Matt. If there's a community that I have had an absolute blast with over the years, it's the Infinity community. Mm. And within the com Infinity community, there's another sub-community. <laughs> and they're the nomads. The nomad, the nomad players within the Infinity community are some of the most hilarious and wonderful people I have ever met. <laughs> and I have a treat for you dudes today. Check this out. So this is the Nomads Matt from Deep Cut Studio. Mm -hmm. oh, dude, this is this is hacker heaven here. Yeah, well, if you think this this is probably on one of their their spaceships. Yeah. You know? So this is probably one of the big either residential or manufacturing areas. Mm -hmm. um, as right, so it only comes in four by four. Yep. And it only comes in neoprene. Yes. Um, but why would you go for anything else as an Infinity player? Well, it's specifically designed for Infinity, so yep. 4x4 gaming area is what they recommend for their games. Mm -hmm. um, let's zoom in. Now, terrain-wise, we uh, pop some terrain down on this just to see what it would look like. This is the stuff from MicroArch Studio. Yep, designed um, for Infinity. It's crackingly good terrain. Mm -hmm. Really, really good terrain. And, and I think... Um, it just blends beautifully mm -hmm. um, well, with the designs on this mat. Yeah. The so. other company that's on this mat is the guys from Game Mat EU. So you've got some cargo containers here and some of the sort of fuel barrels down yeah. here as well, just for the smaller incidental pieces of block mm -hmm. and line of sight. Because when you're playing a game of Infinity, you need a lot of terrain to yeah, lay out. You can really never have too much terrain. So. Well, we've done videos on that. Right. Let's look at some of the details on uh, on the mat. So we have these um, areas where there's a kind of like um, sci-fi flooring with the wonderful Nomad's um, uh, emblem there. But you'll notice that there's parts, let me move this out of the way a little bit, where it's all kind of broken away and you start to see down uh, deeper into, well, well maybe the, the ground or the rusted areas, and then there's all these kind of cables and things uh, mm. going through. Moving back a little bit, you can see more of the cables snaking across these, I suppose I would consider them kind of walkways or trackways or maybe like grav tracks mm. that are, uh, the, if this is a kind of like a, like a manufacturing station or, or well, something. Remember, the nomads don't have planets. They have their big ships. Yeah. So they're generational ships. So if you think they're living century after century on this, so mm -hmm. stuff gets built over, stuff wears down, you know, you have to do your maintenance on it. Maybe this is waiting for some reworking to be done, or they've had yeah. to bring like new data cabling up and out of it, things like that. Isn't it interesting to think of a nomad ship uh, as a generational ship where mm. they would build over the top of stuff, yeah. and then hundreds of years later, a nomad archaeologist archaeologist discovers yeah. something from a previous uh, past generation. Yeah, it's like you when you go into your garage and find an old dot matrix printer. It's exactly like that. Right. Other beautiful things, we have lots of kind of deck areas here marked uh, H3. We have a loading hatch um, here. The, the texturing, the colors, they are so vibrant on this mat. Mm. It just pops. Yeah, and then whenever you see things like the big tags and stuff sitting in this area, yeah, it just looks right for it. It does. Check this out. He's just coming down to kick some ass. Um, there, there's so many uh, little details um, to be seen on this mat, um, but I think overall what I really like about the mat is I like the layout of the pathways. There's uh, one of the one of the potential gotchas in Infinity is big long arcs of fire. Yeah, the fire lanes. So what Deep Cut have done on this particular mat, which is smart thinking, is that they've laid out these kind of pathways to make sure that you can put down lots of blocking terrain between them mm. to stop huge lanes of fire from yeah, appearing. But you're not doing it in a square grid. No. Is the key thing. They are yeah. they are changing angles and stuff the whole time. 
So even your terrain, it feels right to have this setting at an angle and then turning around as it yeah. goes around the corner. So it sort of inbuilds that idea of don't build square infinity boards. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, look, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful mat. Um, it just oozes with the... The feel and flavour of the fact. Yeah, the flavour yeah. of the Nomads. You know, I, I, think it's, I think it's a superb piece of design. Mm -hmm. Yep, anyway, that is your lot. Definitely go and check it out on Deep Cut Studio. This is the Nomad Mat. Kickstarter time. Mm -hmm. Ben, mm -hmm. pressure's on. Oh, God. Not again. <laughs> what? What? This is the beauty of this segment, is because I can say it's Ben's fault. Oh, I had to stop watching because you picked shite Kickstarters. No, I didn't. <laughs> it's his fault. It's his fault. So, three great Kickstarters, so I don't get the, oh, I had to stop watching. Ben? You do realize you're not going to get the, oh, I had to stop watching because you, oh, I still had to stop watching. Right, Ben, go on. Hit, the, hit us with it. What have you got? In fact, I'll pick the first one. Steam Watchers. Yes, we'll go for that one. Right, okay. Uh, let's let's kick off with Steam Watchers. Because we got to play that. It was flipping cool. Yeah. I enjoyed that. Um, so Steam Watchers, it's got... By the time you're viewing this, it's got about seven days to go. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I really liked about this is... Well, it's a 3X slash 4X kind of game. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about this game is since I've played it, it hasn't really left my mind. Mm -hmm. It's been one of those <laughs> ones that, I, as I was playing it, I was thinking, this is really cool. But when I st stepped away from it, it's gradually been playing in my mind over and over again, different things that we could have done. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking, well, this is really, really cool. It's, um, it's a game that you need to, you need to play because there's, yeah. a, there's an awful lot to un unlock in this. At first glance, it looks a little bit like Risk, which I like, actually, because I like the... I, I happen to be a fan of Risk. You know, I know Risk is maybe not one of the, hmm. the games that we, we necessarily put to the top of our pile, but I happen to like Risk. Mm. This is not like Risk in its gameplay, but there's a, there, there's a thing about it that I really just like the, the presentation of it, and I liked the, the depth that you could be digging yeah. in to get Especially this. Especially every time you add another person to the game. Yes. It changes how the game will turn out, which mm. I know sounds very simple, but um, simply because you start with a draft mechanic in your deployment or um, in your faction selection. Yeah. So just having three people choosing and then put a fourth one in, you've only got to find out, I think there's only um, five or six deployment zones. Mm -hmm. There are six deployment zones, six factions to start with. I think there's a seventh on the Kickstarter. Yeah, I'm not, um, even, not yeah. even worried about the additional factions. The fact you've only got six, so even if you if you jump from three to four, yeah, the choices then are massively important because where you deploy, where you start your faction from um, can have massive uh, influences on, on everything mm -hmm. uh, and the impact that it, it changes up the game immensely. Mm. Uh, obviously, the speeder pirates, what are they called? The Free Fleet, one yeah. of my favorites. Are, so yeah, if, I, if I call them up here, so we've got the High Glimmer Apostles, yep. the Meru. Mm -hmm. uh, you've then got the Roan Conglomerate. Mm -hmm. And then the Free Fleet are the ones Jerry's on about. Yes. Yeah, so if you've got any Alpha Striking friends, Take that fleet <laughs> yes. away immediately. Yeah, don't don't let them don't let them have. That I would one. recommend don't use that one particularly in a two player game. Oh yeah, it's broken. Because well, the it's so they broken. have so much more mobility <laughs> than everybody else. <laughs> that they're that broken. <laughs> in, in games with more players, the seas are more locked off. Yeah, yeah, and they just have too much control in a two player game where the seas uh, are open and free for them. Um, uh, you also have the the Ohamfire Stein. Yeah, uh, who are very cool looking, very aggressive faction. And then lastly, you have the Catabasians, who are again very much about movement, but more about movement on land. Yeah. Now, one of the things uh, about this game that struck me, and it's been, again, percolating in my mind, is um, it is a single game for an evening. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a get your friends together, get finest bottle of vodka that you can find. Crystal Skull. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's Dan Aykroyd's, isn't it? Crystal Skull is, Vodka, yeah. yeah. Yes, Dan Aykroyd's. It's, it's get actually Dan, one of my favorites. Get Dan Aykroyd's Vodka. Oh, get you've a real... tried it. Oh, yeah, I've had it. It's uh -huh. bloody great. 
I mean, like, whenever I was I was away in Lanzarote last year, I saw a bottle. It was just like, can I get you home without you being either drunk before I'm home or broken? And did you, you get me home? And you no. talked to the skull no. just like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how I knew thee. <laughs> no, no, it's alas, vodka. I drank thee. So, um... But you definitely for for this game you you, you get your you get your buddies around. Mm. The, this is like poker night. Mm. Right? Yeah. This game is like poker night. You get it. You get the game there. You're going to spend the rest of the evening playing that game mm -hmm. because you are looking about thirty to forty minutes per player. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thirty minutes is what they recommend. Well, well, the, the time we're done bullshitting, Justin, it's yeah. going to be forty-five yeah. minutes yeah. or so. Yeah. yeah. For some of us, longer than that, but. <laughs> You get you get the finest bottle of vodka that you can, mm. okay. And then if you're going to do your mixers with it, you could do like your mule. Uh, you could do all sorts of cool stuff, man. And I can just don't, see. Don't get a fine vodka oh. if you're going to mix it, dude. Get, get yourself no, a good no. sipping vodka. You could you could get any kind of cheap vodka for and mixing, I, yeah. And Adam Savage has so shown us you get a cheap vodka, you stick it through a Brita filter two times. You have a good vodka, man. Okay, I have to see that video. Right? Yeah, absolutely. You get your, you get the cheapest crap you got out there, and you stick it through a bread filter two times, to, and it's. What happens to your forces? Do you put them all on one time, or do they come on gradually? Well, it depends on the vodka. No, so. well, the, so it kind of plays like risk in that as you lose troops, you can recruit more during the game. Mm -hmm. So you could put the troops and stuff on ice cubes. Ah. Oh. 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 When you're drinking, start to try and unlock your troops. Now you see, if <laughs> this you got is my brother. This is why he is awesome. Now, you see, if if you got yourself a, a decent whiskey, you could do uh, a hot whiskey for the the steam coming off it. No, you can't do hot whiskey for this game. It has to be vodka, um, <laughs> possibly pochine. Oh God, no! But but certainly vodka. You know, it's a cold looking game. You know, I look at the game and I look at the look at the coldness and stuff of it, mm. and all I can think of is is, is just it's yeah, just yeah, a, yeah. it's just vodka and my mates. Jerry, we got to do this. I'm all for that. Yeah. We got to do this. We got to get game night on, and you know, game night is never just about the game. It's always about company first and foremost. Yeah. Then your appropriate choice of refreshment, yeah, alcohol, and then finally your appropriate choice of game. Mm. We know our place in the world. We are third in that list. <laughs> okay, we are third in that list. So you know, and when you have that, mm. then it doesn't. It, nothing else in the world matters yeah. because you have all the important stuff. Mm -hmm things and people there. <laughs> One of the things I love about this game is the fact that it's a no-dice game. So yes. It's got that beautiful bluff mechanic built in there where you're betting your resources against your opponent. And if you're playing against Warren, he has the ultimate poker face for that kind of thing. Oh, totally. Totally. I, I bust you on this. Yeah. And the more vodka I get, the better I get. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, like, right. Uh, all right. There, there's one other vodka I would recommend. It's a Polish okay. one. Zabrovka. Zabrovka. Is that the one with the bit of grass in it? Right, bison grass. It's bison really nice, grass. sweet vodka. Mm -hmm. There you go. There you go. Any of the Eastern European liquors would be good at this as well, you yeah. know. Well, we could get so, tea. What? Tea. Somebody slap him. <laughs> no, no, no. So <laughs> it's, it's a type of alcohol from, I think it's Slovakian. Right. And it goes from like 57% right up to 87%. Oh, I've got an alcohol for you, right? There's this show called, um, what is it? Something Extreme Engagement, uh -huh. right? It's this couple traveling around the world and they're going to do these uh, engagement ceremonies and stuff with tribes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they pull up in a boat in Brazil, the deepest, darkest jungle. Yeah. And there's this tribe and they've come out with this big white bowl. And they all start drinking from this white bowl. It's an alcohol of some sort. Yeah. And then later in the episode, it cuts to how they're making it. And they're sitting chewing up these roots. <laughs> Perfect one for Lloyd. I, I was like, I'm out. I have, to, I have to stop watching. Here's the thing, Lloyd. If you were given that, they're not telling you how it's made before you've drank it. Oh, dudes. Right. Uh, next up then, Ben. Okay, you, you you picked it, dude. What are we What are we looking at? 
so the next one of these is called Chronicles and Crime, and this is uh, the Millennium series from a company called Lucky Duck Games. Yes. Uh, and this is a series that exists, has existed before. The Chronicles of Crime series is very well known. Yeah. Uh, the, th the whole idea of it is that it's a little bit of a mystery-solving game. So if you've played things like Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective and stuff in the past, this follows similar veins. The, uh, the games are split up into three different... Well, there are three different games. Uh, there is one set during the 1400s, one set during the 1900s, and one set during the 24,000s. And this is all about following one family throughout all... All of these different time periods, hence the idea of the Millennium series. Uh, and the sort of each of these different boxes are entirely self-contained, uh, and there are four cases within each of them that you'll have to solve in order to complete all of the things in the box. And then you can pass it on to your friends potentially as well. And so it's got that kind of element in there as well. But the cool additional thing in this is that Lucky Duck Games have actually in integrated a lot more sort of app technology as well. And so they have what's called the scan and play uh, sort of mechanics. So all of the details for the cards and the voice acting and all that kind of thing is not just is not on the cards themselves, but you scan them with your phone and then it will come up with an app that you'll share to everyone around the tabletop. As well as that, there's some sort of nifty, interesting thing that they've added into this one where you can actually have VR sort of experiences of the rooms you're looking around in for clues. So what you'll do is that the, a room will come up on your phone in sort of a VR state, and they will actually supply you with VR goggles type glasses things that you can use in order to look around the rooms and see where you can find what you want inside them. I, I will stress, you don't need to have any of that in order to play the game. You can just play the game normally with the standard scanning abilities and that kind of thing as well. Um, I've seen this, a lot of the original games for Chronicles of Crime reviewed and people really, really like them. There's some really sort of interesting storytelling going on there and the fact that it's all done through the app it allows them to do a really interesting thing with voice acting and sort of surprising you with um, sort of twists and turns around the corner and that kind of thing too. As I say, um, all of these games are uh, self-contained, but you can also pick up the entire set. And there may be some running themes that come between them all because obviously as you're following this family, throughout their millennium, a lot of the mysteries and things that happened in, 40, in the 1400s will sort of mix into the 2400s as well, not 24,000s, as I said before. Yeah. Um, they're also doing some really interesting stuff with this too, in that there's what's called the Community Editor Program. And so basically, all of the kits, once you've played through all the different um, cases within them, become like a toolkit for you to use going forward. And the community has really rallied behind Lucky Duck Games and they actually create new interesting murders and mysteries and puzzles for you to solve using the components from the game. So even though you've gone through the four cases that the Lucky Duck Games actually made for you, you can also then use the community in order to go back and play through even more stories if you want to, if you haven't passed it on to someone else. Uh, but yeah, looks really awesome. There's about 18 days left on the campaign as you're watching it now. Seems really interesting and uh, sort of going down a different route when it comes to technology and mystery solving and that kind of thing too. Really like the art style as well and there's loads of content within these. So a really nice sort of party game for a lot of people and we want to dive in and solve some mysteries together. Can you play it without the app? Yeah, I don't believe you can because you have to use the scan and play functionality. Oh, but it's a it's a very simple app anyway. Um, so it just allows you to sort of any phone should be able to play it. So it's one of the guys at the club actually has the the previous edition of this. He has tried to bring it down a few times to get a game on. If you want to give it a go, I'm sure he's happy to bring it. Does it use yep. an app? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Right. So you walk into a room and instead of someone reading a description of the room you scan the QR code, is that what happens? It, it looks like, yeah, you're, you're scanning parts of the QR code and stuff. I like the idea yeah. of sort of the augmented reality thing where you can wear the goggles and clip a phone onto it to look around the room. Yeah, let's see yeah, the goggles I think that's again. Cool. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm, 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 I'm scrolling up as quickly as I can Man, to those, get back to them. Those, those goggles, are kind of cool. They'd make anything small look big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow, Wade. Right. Wow. Yeah, so you put that on. Yeah, and I suppose when you're not you playing see. this game, you could paint with them. So <laughs> I'm sure you probably could. See, I don't know. I think that that's kind of a, a nifty little feature slash gimmick to add to Scroll it. up to yeah, the goggles. It's a nice little additional thing they've added into the campaign, which I think was quite quirky and interesting. But as I said, you don't need that element of the sort of VR augmented reality thing if you don't want to. All so right. I think if you're going in, I think you'll go all in on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've yeah. got to say. You hold them like this, then. You don't actually wear them. Yeah. Oh, you do, so you don't put them on. You, you're, you're yeah, just... here, there, here's just the goggles on their, on their own. Yeah. Because you clip your phone in and then you're holding it up like a pair of binos. Yeah. yeah. Right. I am on record. <laughs> I am on record as, uh, as being pretty anti-app yeah. when it comes to board games. We know. Okay. Um, however... I'd quite like to give this one a try. You curious? 
Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'll tell you why. I think my wife would love this game. Mm -hmm. um, I remember all oh, years and years back when we were dating. Mm. She was nice. And um, <laughs> we were playing, we used to play CSI together on... Mm. Doctors and nurses. X station or whatever the hell it was at the, at the time. Oh, the investigation the Investigation thing. Thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, And we yeah. used to sit and, and do the investigations and look for clues and stuff like that. Mm. And um, I, I, I know that she'd be very into that sleuthing mm. and stuff yeah, like that. The genre. And I actually think that could be a really interesting take on it. Mm. I... Other than my my dislike of apps in board games mm. is because I, I like the disconnectedness of, of tabletop games. Yeah. I like the, the way that um, it, it, it gives us a barrier between ourselves and technology because we're constantly looking at it, okay? Um, that and the fact that the longevity of a game, you know, I could pick games in here that are 25, maybe 30 years old. Yeah, they work and, as well today as they did when um, you bought them. We could, work, uh, we could play that. You know, yeah. We could play that with minimal hassle. Mm. Everything you need is there. Yeah. I couldn't get to play a game of PP Hammer <laughs> today easily. Um, a game that we used to play on the Amiga. Mm. Um, I, I don't know where I would start to, to go and look for that. So, well, you, you'd but probably those... go to a, a site, find a, an emulator, and then download the ROM file. It, but his point is, he would have to go through steps rather than just yeah. lift it off. Rather than just lift it yeah. off. <clears throat> yeah. The it. problem with the QR codes and stuff now is, yeah, it's great now, but in ten years' time, is will, the database going to be there? Will they still be linking? Will the link yeah. still be mm -hmm. live? But that aside, right? That's just a personal preference um, and a personal thing that I have about it. Mm. I'm also a junkie for innovation, mm -hmm. and and I, and I quite like. I quite like what I'm seeing here. This yeah. is the first one I've got to say in a long time where I've been looking at it and going, I, I would really like to try that. Yeah, I, 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 there's something the, like that that's got uh, you. The, th the thing that's really interesting, I, like I um, play effectively, I guess you'd call it the analog version of this kind of thing. And I think we've talked about it before on the show anyway. It's that game that I mentioned before, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. Yes. And that's those case files that you read through and you solve mysteries together. And they're great because they're entirely disconnected from everything. Mm. But I think one of the things that was that is different about sort of looking at things like Chronicles of Crime is that it takes away that element of, potentially accidentally spoiling something for yourself by looking through things and having to flick back and forth between the book and that kind of thing. And also it take it sort of um, extrapolates a lot of that kind of twists and turns that I was talking about with storytelling and adds that back into the the sort of mix, which I think is really cool. Both games are equally as good. I really like Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective and I really like what they're trying to do with Chronicles of Crime as well. Mm. They're just two very different sides, well, two different sides of the same coin effectively. Mm. But um, I think it's a really innov innovative and interesting idea. So yeah. yeah, There is another one out there. Oh, it's Hong Kong Homicide Detective type thing mm -hmm. that was on Kickstarter. Do you remember it, Ben? Yeah, there's, I think it's just called Detective, and then it has a subtitle, I believe, and that uh, uses... Basically, you play a murder similar. detective. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it, it's all analogue, so that might be right up your street. I'll see if I can hunt it down for you. Well, maybe. But um, I've got to say, this one, this mm. one, it intrigues me. It mm. really does intrigue me, from the, but purely from the perspective of, uh, you know, I think it might be an accessible route for, for someone that, that, just, that has mm. never yeah. played yeah. A, a board game of any depth. Mm. Yeah, to, to, yeah to, it's got that sort of half-step crossover. Of any, of any it's, it's something that I would say specifically about the Chronicles of the Crime um, series and what the Lucky Duck Games have done. They're very much more um, board games in that respect, rather than being a little bit more abstract and more like a puzzle-solving yeah. um, sort of story that Consulting Detective is. So it's kind of like a nice bridge between something a little bit more uh, in-depth like, like, like Sherlock Holmes and you know normal board games. Mm -hmm. So it's a good sort of halfway house, I think. So. Right, last one. Mm -hmm. Who is it, Ben? Uh, so last up, uh, we've got Privateer Press, who are on Kickstarter this week for mm -hmm. Warcaster Neo Mechanica. Oh, uh, so yes. we talked about this on a previous show. And this is them diving in to present their new two-player sort of skirmish style game, uh, mm -hmm. which is using 35 millimeter miniatures, and is played out on 4x4 tables. Uh, they talked about it a little bit uh, in previous weeks, diving into the mechanics and sort of how it all plays out. If you've played um, the likes of things like Warmer Hordes and stuff, then a lot of mm -hmm. the sort of concepts that they are playing with are very, very familiar. But some of the interesting twists and tweaks here is that it's sort of 
um, takes the idea of the war castle on the table and sort of brings it out to a little bit more of a god's eye view. And it's effectively like you're summoning and using back, um, units on the tabletop from afar. Imagine if you were in a spaceship what far above the battlefield patrolling things going on on the, on the ground below you. Yeah. As well as that, they've also added in a lot more sort of customization aspects. So a lot of stuff is um, done with the use of cards um, for you know, like building your um, war jacks and your units and things like that. And then you've also got a customizable sort of card deck that allows you to use powers and sort of magical energy is within the world of Warcaster in order to do certain abilities and cast magical spells and psychic stuff and that kind of thing too. Um, the sort of two main factions that they're focused on for the Kickstarter are the Marcher Worlds and the Iron Star Alliance, uh, which we've seen in miniature form in, in metal. And they're also working on a third faction, which is also present on the Kickstarter, called the Eternus Continuum, which have got a little bit more of an alien look to them, and they're a little bit different from the Iron Star and the Marchers to give you a little bit more of an interesting um, sort of uh, aesthetic divide between the, all the different factions there and maybe there's something that you want to pick up if you want to try and be very different from your mates at the table. One of the other cool things they've talked about with this Kickstarter mm-hmm. is that their uh, private press uh, seem to be using this as kind of like a marker for things going forward, especially with uh, Warcaster. And so they have talked about the idea of um, supporting the game in the future effectively just through um, fundraising um, and sort of gauging interest from in the community uh, because what obviously what they've done here is they're trying to take a big step into a new sci-fi game rather than you know looking with you know dealing with worlds that they've done before like War Machine and Hordes mm. and so Kickstarter is a good way to do that kind of thing but they're also looking at things like expansions and rule books and new factions all sort of funded through Kickstarter in the future so it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out but I've watched a couple of the gameplay videos for this. Seems really cool. Um, it's upper limit. You're maybe only having 20 to 30 models on the tabletop. Yeah. Really fast action that goes between back and forth between the different players. Again, has that kind of feel of War Machine and Hordes from the past. Where you've got some really interesting things going on there. Uh, you know, lots of dynamism and characters doing massive bombastic actions and stuff. Uh, really interesting looking models as well. Really nice. To, I like the look of those. Um, so if you like this look, the look of this, uh, maybe give it a look on Kickstarter, watch some of their videos and see what you think. Absolutely. I can't wait to try this on. This feels like Privateer going back to their roots, to yeah. that nice light skirmish game that War Machine and Hordes used to be. It's a uh-huh. lot bigger, a lot heavier these days. Yeah. Because you're, you're feeling bigger and bigger forces. Uh-huh. And this just draws it back to that nice tight tactical gameplay that you used to have with them. Well, I can't, I can't wait to see it. I've been watching some of the live casts and stuff of it. it. It really does look I was going to say, one of the interesting things actually is that. Um, Typical to sort of what Privateer Press have done in the past with War Machine and, and, and Hordes and stuff, the actual sort of base level set of monitor models you need to even play the game is about three or five models. Um, so actually getting into it and playing it at this very base level and just learning how to play is actually quite simple. It doesn't yeah. take too much time and investment. So it's a good way to dive in and play something at the lower level and then extrapolate it as you go. So Fantastic. Cool. Right. That wraps us up. Mm-hmm. We are done for another Friday night. Kick ass. So, yeah. um, What's left to say? Why not come across, join the cult of games, and become one of us? Join our cult. Join our cult. <laughs> and we will see you on Sunday morning. Big thanks to the team. It's been a good one. Justin, we are going to go and eat cucumbers together now. No. <laughs> I will see you all soon. Stay tuned. Come across. Join the cult of games. Enter the competition. Win prizes. Be awesome. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.